We introduced the idea last time of Eliyahu and Navi, Elijah the prophet, as a unifier. And in particular, we encounter him in, in this situation where there's a northern kingdom called Yisrael and a southern kingdom called Yehuda, and they have split and separated since the time after Shlomo, King Solomon, the second Davidic king of Israel. And Baal worship, worship of this false Canaanite rain god, is rampant in the northern kingdom. And El Eliyahu is coming to not just rebuke and instruct the northern kingdom that they should be turning back to Hashem, but you could, to put a more positive spin on it, say, bring them back to the full, right? Because that really, as we referred to before, ends up being what's happening. And we can talk about that again uh, further on. That at some level, what Eliyahu represents, perhaps, is the, de the desire not to write off a huge portion of B'nai Yisrael because they have made what seems like an irrevocable choice to break away from Jerusalem, from the temple, from Yehuda, and go their own way and start to base the way their kingdom operates more on foreign idolatry. And Eliyahu represents this, this desire to figure out how to make one nation that serves Hashem again. And uh, what I think is particularly interesting about that for the present day is that it is about the ideal of unity at some level, right? I mean, one of the models we hear very frequently during this present period uh, since the war started here in Israel is the motto, Yachad Nenatzeach, we will be victorious together. And that seems like a, a very reasonable thesis from uh, a, a rational standpoint. Disunity usually leads to failure and defeat. And it also really sentimentally and even more, you know, intellectually appeals at the level of uh, national feeling and, uh, let's say, intuition for what you think HaKadosh Baruch Hu must, must want from his people. Right? He wants us to be one nation and he wants us to succeed together. But the problem, of course, is that unity cannot be achieved in the wrong way, according to the understanding of Tanakh and according to the understanding of the Torah. Because if you have different parties coming together and the way that they're coming together is they're compromising and what they're compromising on is which gods they worship, that's too much of a problem from the standpoint of the Torah. Akadosh Baruch Hu is very flexible about many things uh, and when it devolves down to the level of halakha, of, of Jewish law and in praxis, uh, and, and leaves room for the sort of challenges and contradictions of life to flourish, you know, with a lot of different constraints to be satisfied simultaneously. However, when it comes to idol worship or, you know, service of other gods, there isn't much room left for compromise. And if you can't compromise on that, that produces a conundrum. There's a puzzle here because through the lens of Tanakh, of the Hebrew Bible, when you look at Eliyahu, the situation that he's in is that the Northern Kingdom is committed to worshiping Baal. And worshiping Baal is not 50% okay or 20% okay. It's simply not okay. It's not permitted, and it has to stop. But one way of getting rid of it or you know, forbidding it, so to speak, is simply to write off all these people and say, okay, so you're out of the, out of the club. I don't know what we're going to call you guys now, but you're not part of B'nai Yisrael anymore. You're just Baal worshippers who live in the land of Israel and you know, we'll, we'll consolidate our efforts around the temple in Yehuda, and then maybe one day Yehuda will become strong enough and it will conquer you and throw you out just like the other Canaanites or something like that. But that's not the policy here. The idea is not to say, okay, forget about half a nation or more than half a nation because they're 
on the wrong path. Uh, and so they're, we're done with them. They're not part of the tribe anymore because by definition, they've sort of removed themselves uh, from that status uh, by turning away from Hashem. On the contrary, a repeated theme in the Torah is that all of B'nai Yisrael are Hashem's people. And when we turn away from him, he doesn't write us off and cut us off and reject us. He gives us a lot of leeway and, and mercy. And then he punishes us and he scatters us, but then he brings us back. And he brings us back to the land and he brings us back to him and all these things. And he doesn't sort of forget the covenant uh, with Avraham and that, all the other britot that you know came afterwards, all the other covenants that bind the nation together. So if that's the way to look at it, then how is Eliyahu supposed to proceed? How do you unite the nation in a way that isn't about, all right, I'll meet you halfway, we'll make a pantheon with Baal and Hashem, but Hashem has to have a bigger idol, or, you know, like there's no there's no room for that kind of solution. So what's the other solution? The solution that Eliyahu ends up pursuing is to create a contest where he can win over worshippers of Baal by shattering their faith in Baal and affirming their faith in Akadosh Baruch Hu. And that is uh, a significant and real question how that kind of thing might be achieved in the present day. Um, because the nation is split a million different ways. Um, the, the the period of time before the war, you know, the year leading up to it was obviously uh, a famously historic period of national division over political issues that really do pertain to, you know, questions of religious observance in part and the role of the Torah in society, but lots of other things as well. And, and so there are things perhaps we might want to be trying to learn about how do you unify the society because we need to be unified, right? The Yachad Nenatzeach is good advice. You know, it, it's, it appears in, in other forms on other lips, right? You're united, we stand, divided, we fall. It's commonsensical, right? You have to, um, you have to work together in order to be effective, especially, you know, in times of war. So if that's the goal, how do you unite the nation again, not by compromising on the wrong things? And I think it would be it would be harmful to try to portray things in a very black and white and dyadic and simple way where you say, well, there's of course the part of society that is committed to Torah and they're 100% correct. And there's the part of society that isn't so interested in the Torah and they're not correct. And, you know, that is the axis along which we need unification. And, you know, there's no meeting halfway. So we just need to get everyone who's not interested in the Torah to, you know, hop on board. Uh, there's more than 0% truth to that picture of things on the one hand. And on the other hand, it's obviously much more complicated. There's all sorts of different kinds of getting it wrong. Uh, there are sort, you know, all sorts of different kinds of, idolatries or, you know, uh, attempts at keeping only part of the Torah and not all of it, you might make the argument that it is not less the case that, let's say, in the Haredi world, which is supposed to be the most religious part uh, of the Jewish world, that there are parts of the Torah that are getting mothballed and ignored, um, and, and not less so in that sector than in other sectors that we think of as not being interested in the Torah, but maybe in other ways are, are more uh, easily hitting some of the high notes. Um, but again, while mostly ignoring, you know, much else of what's in the Torah. So let's, you know, let, let's avoid a simple or simplistic characterization that would say there's two camps in the current Israeli society and, and one of them is correct and one of them isn't. Uh, there are many camps, and they all have their feelings and all things they need to work on. But overall, I think you still could say that, again, viewing this from the standpoint of the Torah, if we're going to succeed as a society by being unified, 
we want as much as possible for that unification to be rallying around the banner of the Torah and not rallying around the banner of the outward appearances of religiousness or orthodoxy necessarily, but around the banner of Hashem, of actually doing what Hashem wants us to do, which we learn by studying the Torah, but also which we learn from the Torah, sometimes in ways that are different than, you know, uh, what uh, people sometimes call Talmud Torah or, or the study of Torah. So how do, how do we how do we achieve that in a way that um, could actually put this nation at this time in this you know great historic moment uh, on the right track? So I think uh, there are maybe a few details in this passage, this famous contest that Eliyahu sets up with Nevi Baal, the, the prophets of Baal, that are worth looking at. So I'll read most of the English and some of the Hebrew um, to get us through this expeditiously. So they gather in Har Carmel, uh, and Eliyahu kind of starts by taunting them and talking to the people and saying, so it says, Eliyahu, so Elijah came to the people and he said, How long will you hop or hobble or skip or choose between or waver between two opinions? Uh, well, we'll return to how to translate the word poshim in due course. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So Eliyahu was setting up the, the question, you know, why, why are you trying to have more than one God? Uh, and now he's going to describe uh, the... Contest, the terms of the contest. Then said Eliyahu to the people, I'm the only remaining prophet of Hashem, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bowls and let them choose one bowl for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And call you on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. So they're going to do this test. It's like a, an experiment or an empirical test. Uh, everyone's trying to do something that is hard to do without some kind of miraculous event. You need fire to come from nowhere in order to light the offering. Uh, and Eliyahu is going to let the Nevi'e Baal try first. So then they do their... Um, Preparations wait. Who eth hapar asher natan lehem? We yasu wait who b'shem habaal me aboker we ad hatzoraim le emor habaal anino we ain kol we ain ane we yifas who al hamizbeach asher asa. There's that word again, which is not a very common word. Was him, and then now we have we yifas who that it appears twice, and. So we'll read the English first. And they took the bowl, which was given to them, and they prepared it and called in the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice and no answer. And they leapt upon the altar, which was made. So, which they made. Um, the Here, poshim is being translated as, or Yifasho is being translated as leaping. So we may recognize the word Pesach in there, right? Pesach is called Pesach because the Mashhit, the slayer in the time of the striking of the firstborn, striking the firstborn of Egypt, um, the slayer skipped over the houses of the Ivrim, or maybe uh, delayed or tarried or limped and somehow didn't get there, or maybe uh, hovered, you know, people translated different ways. So um, hovering uh, would be in then that case be kind of to protect the house from the mashrit. I've heard it argued, but in any case, it's like all these different words that are either skipping or jumping or limping or, or wavering or hovering. And, and in the context of Nevi'e Baal, it's, it's about their um, first 
Unfortunately, in the case of Poshim, it's El Eliyahu saying, why can't you make up your mind? Why can't you decide uh, which God to pick? Why would you, you know, sort of try to maybe serve both of them? Or why would you kind of jump back and forth and sometimes serve one and sometimes serve the other? You know, so it's it's more complicated than just saying, look, you've left Hashem um, and you're going to Baal instead, which I think is uh, a, a salient point at some level, getting back to this question initially of saying, well, why, why don't we just write them off, so to speak? It's more complicated than just saying, okay, now they worship Baal, they've abandoned Hashem. The idea of relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is still in the mentality of the kingdom of Israel. This is a conversation that's possible for Eliyahu to have with them. Even though Baal is on the rise, so to speak, and people aren't serving Hashem well, this isn't the same thing as showing up in Tzidon or Tzor or Ninwe or whatever um, and calling on them to remember the Torah when they would say, well, we didn't get the Torah and, you know, who is this Hashem anyway? Like Paro says, you know, that there is knowledge of Hashem in, in the kingdom of Israel. Uh, and I think that's relevant to the present day as well, meaning that there are all sorts of Jews uh, in the state of Israel, and some of them are very explicitly interested in keeping the Torah, and some of them keep a fair amount of the Torah without even thinking about it, uh, but they don't see themselves as being explicitly interested in it. Some uh, small minority are mortally opposed to anything that had the smell of Torah, or what you would call Judaism, or what have you. Uh, but the point is that the actual number that you would say have consciously and deliberately completely turned away from Yadut or Torah, from Judaism or from the Torah, that's actually quite small. It's not zero because there were a lot of hardcore communists at the early founding of the state, and some of them taught institutionalized hatred of religion, including Judaism. And so, you know, you have a, a very uh, heady mixture here in the different strata or uh, sectors in society. But most of the people who identify as what you would call quote-unquote secular uh, in the current state of Israel still keep many Jewish traditions, celebrate some of the holidays and do things on Shabbat, you know, but don't do other things on Shabbat, uh, keep kosher this way, but not that way. There's, there's a very gray spectrum and there's a whole lot of knowledge of the tradition and participation in parts of the tradition and positive feeling towards it. And, you know, you'll have a whole bunch of people who'd say, you know, maybe they believe in God, but they, it's not for them, like all the sort of ritual stuff, whatever, right? So people come up with all sorts of different positions. But the point is that Am Yisrael has a deep connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that is not so easy to sever just by, you know, saying, okay, we're not going to keep kosher anymore, or we're not going to keep Shabbat anymore, and then taking that down through a couple of generations. You still have the desire even for connection, but even if not, knowledge, some nostalgia, some sentimentality, some affection, some, you know, familial connection, et cetera. And so we're we're one nation um, and, and we're still united by the shared history we have in Torah, even if not all of us um, are so consciously trying to keep it right now. And and that I think is, you know, contained here in this idea of, of poschim, of, of like, sort of wavering between Hashem and Baal. Um, but also then, you know, it, it, it says they, it re-emphasizes the word using it a different way, saying they, they jumped on their altar. Well, you fuss hope like this. So that's some of their limping or leaping or wavering or whatever, or hovering. But the point is that they're trying to sort of, you know, get Baal animated. And, and so they're doing some kind of um, activity to do that. But I think the repetition of the word really is trying to drive home it's not just that we needed a verb and this was the perfect verb and it just so happens that it reminds you of Pesach. It's saying the thing about Pesach, like using this verb twice for two different purposes in the space of a few verses, it's, and, and this, this appears almost nowhere else, um, this verb, uh, to the degree that that's the case, now we have to kind of ask, well, what is the connection to Pesach here? And I don't want to try to answer that question quite yet, but I do think that there, you know, there may be one. Um, but so, long story short, the um, uh, 
the Nevi'i Baal are not successful, the blood doesn't, sorry, the, the fire doesn't come down and take their offering. Um, there's an interesting additional asuk after Eli, I was mocking them and saying, oh, maybe your God is asleep and he's not listening. So they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. So this is interesting because these are these prophets of Baal. They're doing things that are forbidden in the Torah. They're cutting the body. Um, the, the word go to do is interesting because uh, it is midrashically or in sort of midrash alacha, it's connected with the rebellion of Korach, which also interestingly has a contest uh, where there's a sort of demonstration of whether Hashem is with the, the prophet or not. Um, the reason it comes up with that is because the word for bald, kareach, or reach, um, is in the in another example of a mitzvah where we're told uh, about uh, different things that you're not supposed to do uh, to yourself because your body has the sanctity of Tzalem Elohim. You're not supposed to rip your hair to make yourself bald and you're a mourner. And you're also not supposed to cut yourself. Um, but Chazal, in this interesting way, with this word go to do or the, the root of go to do, what they say about that is you shouldn't make yourself into agudot. You shouldn't split yourself into different little sects and groups, which is an interesting reference. It's, we had to dig for it a little bit. And so, you know, you can leave it where it is if it's not, uh, if it's too many leaps uh, from the text itself here. But I can't help noticing like the, the connection to the idea of splitting the nation into a whole bunch of tiny little separate pieces. Chazal associated this, this verb of gdud uh, with the idea of sectarianism in the nation. And that is part of the problem that we're dealing with here um, in this bit of plot. I mean, in any case, so they're doing their cutting themselves kind of like um, zealots in Iran do for the um, Mahdi, uh, I want to call them celebrations, but sort of public flagellations and mornings um, that they have in their practice. So this is, you know, ancient Near Eastern cutting yourself thing, which, you know, carried down into the practice of other you know, cults that developed since. Um, but the point is they're doing their practices and it doesn't work. So now Eliyahu's turn comes up and he tells the people to come to him. He builds up the altar of Hashem that was broken down. It says, Waikah Eliyahu shteim esre avanim kemispar shivtei b'nei Yaakov asher haya devar Adonai elav le'emor Yisrael yehye shemecha. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. All right, so this is unbelievable redundancy in this pasuk, because if you just had 12 stones, 12 stones already to someone who's even a cursory reader of the Torah makes you think, okay, 12 stones, where do I see 12 stones? Oh, what about the breastplate that the Kohen wears in the temple? And those 12 stones are meant to represent the 12 tribes. And the number 12 is the number of the tribes and the number of sons of Jacob, and I know that. But here the text is being laborious about saying there are 12 stones according to the number, not just of one of these things, of the tribes, but of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. Like they're reminding you that the tribes came from the sons of Jacob, who all had the same father, and to whom Hashem gave the name Yisrael, saying this will be your name. So the text is saying, okay, the name Israel. What is the name Israel? The name Israel is about all the tribes, like B'nai Yisrael, that is all the different sons of Jacob. And all the different sons of Jacob have to be together, right? And interestingly here, it's 12 stones. It's not 12 uh, piles of sand, or it's not uh, 12 uh, stacks of grain or whatever. It's 12 stones. And what 
distinguishes stones among other things is that you can't put them back together. They seem like they're impossible to put back together. If I take one stone and I crack it in half, maybe I can fit the crack you know, together on each side so that it kind of looks like one stone again. But really, I've now broken it apart and it's two objects. And it doesn't just fuse back together into one stone just because I kind of try to put it back together. So the stones represent some kind of notion of irreparable separateness that we're dealing with here in this situation with the kingdom of Yehuda and the kingdom of Israel. And here we are in the northern kingdom called Yisrael. And Eliyahu is saying, remember the name Yisrael, the name of your kingdom, that's for all of B'nai Yisrael. That's for one nation of all the different sons of Yaakov that became one nation. And he's going to take these 12 stones that seemingly are irreparably separated somehow. And he's putting them together into one arrangement that he's assembling uh, in the Mizbeach, in the, in the altar. And not only that, so then he says, he makes a ditch, he digs a ditch, and he's going to start filling the ditch with water. So it says, you know, he puts the wood on, and he's going to put the cut-up, you know, sacrificial bowl on. But then it gets to, So he arranges the bowl and the, the, the wood, and puts on the altar. Okay, so he said, do it the second time, and they did it. The second time. Uh, sorry, sorry, I skipped one. It said, and he said, fill, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did. Okay, so four jars of water. A first time, a second time, third time. That's three times four. Makes 12. So it's again 12. 12 jars of water. But he doesn't just say, take 12 jars of water and dump it on. He says, take four jars of water and dump it on. And then four more, and then four more. So three times four. Now we're taking the 12 tribes of Israel. And we're breaking it apart somehow into three and four. What does three and four make you think of? Well, there were three Avot, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and there were four Imahot, Sarah, Rivka, Leah, and Rachel. So it is evoking not only the idea of these are all the sons of Yaakov that make up the nation, but remember everyone, you're all the descendants of all the Avot and all the Imahot, that the basis of our being a nation together comes from the fact that we're part of this one tree of life, this one genealogical tree that traces itself back to this small number of people, these few generations back at the beginning. So it's reminding you that the basis of our common heritage does have to do with our being a family. That, you know, this is, we're all brothers and sisters, right? We're all part of the same family. So it's an emphasis on the shared lineage and shared heritage and shared family background of the nation so that we can feel connected to each other by having this um, sense of, of familial relationship. And he also is pouring water all over everything, which is really going to be hard um, if uh, you're trying to get things to catch on fire, which is the test, remember, that Elia was trying to pass. So he's you know, building things up so that the miracle can be really great. Uh, and also at the same time, this is, you know, a period of drought after years where there's really very little water to go around and people are dying of thirst and hunger everywhere. Um, doesn't say he uses seawater for this. Um, and one would tend to think that that would be uh, a tough request at the top of a mountain next to the sea. So maybe it's seawater, even though it doesn't say anything like that. Um, but more likely, it's fresh water, which means he's saying take water, like water suitable for an offering, perhaps, um, uh, that you could have drunk, but instead you're just going to pour it into this trench in the ground. So there's something, you know, very expensive and something very um, connected with the uh, the punishment that Eliyahu um, had declared for the people 
um, from Hashem for, for turning away from him and, and worshiping the rain god. Uh, and when all of this gets put together, now Eliyahu makes this great declaration, and he says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. So that's wrapping everything that we just said together. Right? It doesn't even just he doesn't even just say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, because it's Bene Israel, it's the name of the kingdom. But it's saying, look, Israel. It was the son of Isaac, and Isaac was the son of Abraham, and really we're all one family, and that's how this works. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Aneni Adonai, Aneni Weedo Ha'am, Azeki Ata Adonai, Elohim, Wata Hasibota et Libam Achroniv. So then the fire comes down, it consumes everything, right? So fire of Hashem came down and it consumed the sacrifice and the wood pile and the stones and the dust and the water, everything. The whole thing is taken. And I think that's, important for various reasons. Obviously, partly it's a great miracle, right? Because fire doesn't usually consume water. So this is, you know, the clear answer of the supremacy of Hashem over nature. If he, just, if he wants to accept the offering, he accepts the whole offering. I mean, it also, interestingly, he dug a trench around this and filled it with water. Uh, if, if you're looking always for the sort of like through natural laws, how this could have happened, it, it's still going to be a great wonder because you can't get this to happen, you know, whenever you want. Um, but a sinkhole may be part of the explanation in the sense that the whole thing just disappeared in a puff of smoke. Um, and depending on what else happened at the same time, uh, you could end up with a situation where it seems like the whole thing was consumed by fire, when in fact it may have sunk into the ground. And that doesn't make it not a wonder because people don't expect these things. And when they happen, and no one expects it, um, it, it, it can change their relationship to Akadosh Baruch Hu. And it also you know, maybe rely, reminds us again of the rebellion of Korach, with things going down to the ground. But I think the point is, in any case, that in addition to showing the supremacy of Hashem over nature, there's another significant aspect here, which is thinking about the fact that the whole offering was consumed. All right, not the whole offering, the whole altar, the whole setup, the whole assemblage, which means the stones were consumed, which means a whole thing that was composed in part of the 12 supposedly impossible to reunite stones is the thing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu took as his offering. And what that means is it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu saying, look, I'm not interested in eating a bull, right? That's for pagan gods. If you want to make an offering to some pagan god, you can think that you're feeding the god and buying some kind of favor back in your direction, like give us rain because I gave you a bull. But that's not what this is about. This is about Akadosh Baruch Hu showing us what he approves of from us, what he expects of us, what he wants from us. And the assemblage that Elio creates, the whole symbolic structure of that is the thing that Akadosh Baruch Hu is putting his stamp of approval on. And the thing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is approving of is a structure or an assemblage that as a whole contains what we just talked about, right? The 12 stones, all the stones, all 12, not just the ones that are still interested in the Torah, not the other ones that are richer or whatever, all of them. And another dose of 12 with the water that's four by three, to remind us of the familial connection. So this is telling us a bit of what is the basis for unity that HaKadosh Baruch Hu would like us to take hold of. And part of that is the national aspect and the tribal aspect, right? That's the thing that we have to fall back on when we're all over the place and everyone is doing their own separate kind of ideological failure with some idolatry that they're doing, whether they are this kind of 
religious person or that kind of Chilonim person or whatever, you know, that kind of secular person, that everyone's off the rails in some way, what do we still all have in common? That we're a nation that came from Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and Sarah, and Rivka, and Leah, and Rachel, and that we're one family, and that that produces bonds of responsibility and love and kinship um, that we cannot ignore and that we even can't, to some degree, break free of, even, even if we would want to. And so part of the message here clearly is like those Baruch who is saying, I approve of that as a basis for unity that somehow is a different basis for unity than compromising and worshiping other gods some of the time, right? So it's a little bit of a, uh, a paradox because this miracle in this demonstration is supposedly proving that Hashem is completely correct. And everyone who's there sees that and, and would, of course, say, oh, all right, I'm going to go with Hashem now. That was an amazing wonder. I'm totally bowled over. I, I no longer think Baal can do anything, and it's all Hashem. But if you actually think about how would you try to achieve something like this, uh, it's, it's very hard to imagine that the lasting impact of what you can do with a wonder is just dazzle people with something that impressed them, and then they're going to just do the right thing forever. We've already seen how that doesn't work with the liberation from Egypt, right? Moses comes with his staff that turns into a serpent, and also Aaron is a staff that turns into a tanin, and to a you know some other kind of reptile or whatever. And then the Egyptians of Pharaoh also have staffs that turn into taninim into some kind of reptiles. So it, the text itself is emphasizing, like, oh, with, well, in in someone else's view, this is just a parlor trick. But the message of the staff and the serpent is the thing that is actually durable, right? That when you study that sign, there's many things it's conveying to B'nai Yisrael when Moshe brings that sign. And here, similarly, it's the structure of the sign itself, the consumption of the offering that we have to, do, you know, to study to understand, like, what, what is the, the way of, of uniting the nation? And the only thing I would add is there's something perhaps a little bit too uh, simple about the idea that it's all about kind of nationality and tribalism. That the, the message here is, on the one hand, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants national unity. Right? He wants us to recognize our shared bonds of kinship and responsibility and love and all of that and say we're one family. And he wants us to do that with all the tribes, not just the tribes that haven't gone off the rails, so to speak. But at the same time, if that were the full basis, it would leave open the question of, well, but how do you actually, how do you actually generate that unity in a way that's substantive, that doesn't involve some kind of, all right, let's all get together, and I love you, you're my cousin, and you're an idolater, but I love you anyway, and, and I'll do what you do because I love you. And suddenly it is the case that we're just kind of compromising on the, the ideological position and saying, okay, we'll just include Hashem in the pantheon. Um, so if that's not what we're doing, then where is the, the hint of like how, what's the different mechanism for unity? Even if we say, okay, we have the goal of national unity because we are one family and we can we can find, we can reach deep and find motivation for that by saying, look, I disagree with you and you disagree with me and we don't have the same politics or we, you know, have different views about the role of, uh, let's say, the, the state in controlling and limiting religion or the role of religion in influencing uh, the sort of responsibilities and uh, powers of the state, et cetera, et cetera, like all this kind of Western language for talking about this challenge. Like we could have those disagreements um, and maybe we still can find a way of hugging each other and saying, okay, but we're family and we're all in this together. And, you know, we, we made it here after thousands of years of exile or our parents did or our grandparents did or, or whoever. And now that we did, um, we we have to figure out a way of finding the next step together and 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 taking it um, as a, a unified front. But if 
we're not going to do that in a way that just kind of communicates different idolatries everywhere, then how, what, what is the alternative mechanism for that? And I think that um, the hint may be in this word having to do with Pesach, this repetition of Oshim and then Yivashu, because now we, we can think about not just what the verb means and what it therefore means in the context of this passage, but also what the original use of that word, Asah, in the context of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, of the exodus from Egypt and the striking of the firstborn, what did it mean? What was the whole thing that happened there? The whole thing that happened there was that there was this plague coming that was going to strike all the firstborn of everyone in Egypt, but Bnei Yisrael separated themselves and made themselves distinct by slaughtering the lamb and roasting the lamb and painting the blood on their doorway and lentil and all of that stuff that we know. So what we have in that instance is an act of sacrilege within the context of Mitzrayim, within the context of the foreign pantheon that people were a part of and ruled by and, and um, uh, worshipping and all of that in Mitzrayim, that slaughtering a lamb was blasphemous. And slaughtering a lamb was a, an open act of rebellion. In case we're worried about whether it's open or not, they're not just slaughtering the lamb in the basement, right? You have to paint the blood on the door uh, and say, look, there's lamb's blood. I mean, it's amazing because lamb even has like a very distinctive taste and smell. Like it, it's, it has a, a much stronger aroma than some other meats. And so really like you paint the lamb's blood on the door and it's like, look, I slaughtered a lamb, even though that is some kind of blasphemous high treason here in Mitzrayim. And it was the whole Israelite nation performing that act of blasphemy because it was a command from Hashem. So for the sake of the Torah, they defiled the foreign gods and that bound them together. That was another way that they were sort of unified and brought together as a nation when the nation was first being minted uh, in Mitzrayim, in Egypt. So if you look at it in those terms, I think maybe the opportunity here is to say that a way that Bnei Yisrael as a whole can be unified, uh, the focus can be on the turning away from the false god as opposed to uh, a sort of clear embrace of everything that serving Hashem entails. Because that's the hard part, right? Getting someone to say, Hashem hua Elohim, you know, like I now recognize that Hashem has, has the power, right? All they had to do was watch a wonder occur. And maybe afterwards they'll, they'll think about, okay, so now that I've said that, what are the implications for how I have to act? And when the other foot drops, that's a lot of work or a lot of changes. So maybe you get some of those changes. And we talked about before how uh, Ahav starts acting better to some degree for a time with Eliyahu and Eliyahu maybe has more influence and Ahav makes a sort of compact with Yehoshaphat and there is unification between Yisrael and Yehuda and they're fighting their battles together. And so there are consequences after the fact where there's real substance to the, the outcome of this event. And maybe some of that also results in people keeping mitzvot or whatever. But the point is that it, this is not a story about people uh, in particular, kind of uh, taking hold of mitzvot and doing them in a way they hadn't before and sort of relearning them. This is a story about rejection of Baal, uh, about realizing that Baal is a false god that should just be thrown on the trash heap. And that also is kind of the element of what's going on in Pesach as well, that the sort of bare minimum to ante up and sort of step into uh, good standing as a member of this new nation that's being created is to reject the gods of the Egyptians and do so publicly uh, and uh, take 
some risk in doing that, right? Like they're risking their lives by doing that, but they do it together and it turns out that it actually saves their life instead of it being, you know, a risk to them. Uh, but risking being punished for blasphemy in ancient Egypt is no small matter. So when we look at that in the context of Elio, I, I think the way the way to think of it is that if you're going to try to get these broken apart stones of the different tribes to come back together, one of the things you need is powerful national feeling, you know, and I think since the war started, we have a lot more of that, Baruch Hashem, and that's that's uh, one of the few good things to uh, come out uh, of the horrendous way that this war started is that it has shocked the nation into understanding that our enemies are what we actually have to direct our wrath at instead of at each other. Um, and that, uh, you know, strengthens the sense of we're in this together, we're one nation, you know, we are all trying to help each other and save each other and all of that. And all that's to the good. But it's not enough to just have that feeling. And like we said, it's not going to work to say, let's meet halfway. And it's also not going to work to say, okay, so let's figure out which tribe was right. And then everyone else just does what that tribe is doing and admits they were wrong. Because that's the hardest thing. That's the, the sort of, everyone thinks that they're right, right? The Torah is not about relativism. It doesn't say that all the different 12 separate stones are each equally correct. There is someone who's correct here, which is Eliyahu. Eliyahu says that Hashem is the one God, and he's correct about that. But um, while the Torah is not relativistic, it understands the psychological and social difficulty of relativism from the many perspectives that are involved, right? So if you have all these different people, they all think they're doing the right thing. They may not all be doing the right thing equally well, but it's very hard to convince someone that their whole way of doing things is upside down. Um, and you don't really have much of a chance of doing that by argument, usually. <laughs> it usually requires people first being shocked in some way and um, beholding wonders and, and and whatever else. So the alternative that's being suggested here by this connection to Pesach, I would want to argue, is the recognition that even when Am Yisrael are not so inclined to turn all the way to Hashem and embrace all the all of the Torah, because that's very difficult for everyone, no matter who you are, that what we have in common, going back, interestingly, to Avraham, like our, all the way back to where we came from, our, our beginnings with Avraham Avinu, it's the idol smashing bug, right? It's, it's that what we're always good at, whether we're religious or whether we're secular, whether we're this or whether we're that, what we're always good at is pointing out that some gods are clearly garbage, right? It's commonly the case that Jews throughout history have been very good at pointing out that this is idolatry, and then they turn around and pick another form of idolatry that they decide they want to believe in, right? And they so they, they get the worst of both worlds and incur the wrath of the people that they've been... Um, uh, provoking by sort of humiliating their gods, and then they turn around and don't actually have uh, it right, and they you know stumble over the contradictions of the other idols that they've chosen. Uh, so you know you see that in many kinds of examples. Um, but the point is, there's a positive and useful ability there that the whole tribe shares, which is this cantankerous tendency to do some idol smashing, right? To ask questions and to not be, you know, easily won over by scams or by smoke and mirrors and to, to probe things and to turn them over and to look at them this way and that and kick the tires and demonstrate that someone else's theory is stupid and demonstrate that someone else's claim about how their magic works is actually a lie and everything else. And not just like with ancient idols, but also with modern ideas, right? That uh, you 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 have Jews who are purveyors of every sort of 
false modern idea, but you also have other ones who come along and are some of the most brilliant eviscerators of those ideas. Um, and that just has to do with the, the discursive quality of the culture, right? That once you have that um, in your language and in your bones and in your family and your tradition, as we know, you know, especially in the 19th and 20th centuries and 21st century, huge numbers of Jews who are totally estranged from Yahadut, from Torah, have retained at a cultural level a kind of incisiveness about how to critique ideas um, that is, is applicable and is useful in the destruction of certain idolatries, even if one is not um, so versed in what those Baruch wants from us. And of course, what often happens in the secular version of that is that people get too clever for their own good and they start saying, well, I'm such a good idol smasher, then I'll smash the idol of Hashem and I'll prove the biblical religion is stupid. Um, and that usually ends up being some kind of, you know, folly of uh, low intellectual standards where you sort of idol smash a straw man instead of addressing the tradition in its real depth. Um, but in any case, what that means in practical terms, and this is you know, where I think we can close uh, for this discussion, is if we were asking now about the present day, what does Am Yisrael need in this moment? We need to be unified. We need to be united. We need to, you know, Yahad Nenetzeach has truth to it. But it can't be an empty slogan where we just say, let's all get together even though we don't agree and get together on the basis of nothing. Or let's all, you know, throw away all our standards and get together on the basis of the lowest common denominator where no one believes in anything anymore or everyone abandons their God, including the people who had it right at some level and were insisting on Hashem and his Torah. You know, that's not what we want. But if that's not what we want, then what could be the mechanism for substantive increase in unity aside from external threat aside from we're one nation we're one tribe they don't want to kill us all of that all of that helps but on top of that the opportunity that this mention of Pesach in the text is suggesting is that it may be that there is an opportunity to unify around rejection of certain foreign gods or foreign idols or foreign standards or whatever, uh, even when doing so doesn't automatically guarantee that everyone now is sort of on the same page in, yes, we have to serve Hashem and this is how we have to serve Hashem, right? Because that's what we need. We need it to be the case that there is something we can agree on that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will see as he turned towards him but that doesn't require everyone signing up first for exactly this kind of keeping kasher and exactly this kind of keeping Shabbat and all the other stuff. Because that kind of demand for unity is, is much more just saying, let's make two rocks that are split apart, you know, fused back together uh, by getting one of the rocks to agree that actually it was completely wrong and it should just start doing what the other rock is doing, right? That's not going to happen. Um, that's an unrealistic goal for the short term in uh, the society. It's a you know, wonderful goal to have in the long term when everyone evolves towards the, the better goal that Hashem wants us to have because everyone has changes they need to make and things they need to fix, religious and secular and Haredi and Dati and whatever, all the different varieties and stripes. But in the short term, if we're going to all turn together towards Hashem, it's going to be because we're turning together away from some foreign god, some foreign standard that we can at least agree is stupid. <laughs> and fortunately, in the current situation, I think it might be the case, Bezrat Hashem, that there is potential for that kind of a turn. Maybe not with 100% of people in this country, but at least with um, a a plurality, a significant percentage, and a significant plurality from different sectors of all kinds. And why is that? Think again about the, the prophets of Baal, that part of what they're doing is they're, they're jumping back and forth and lashing themselves and, and doing all of their activities, all their magic that's supposed to work. And it's not 
fixing things. It's not getting the result that people are trying to get. The fire doesn't come down. What does it mean that Hashem doesn't accept, accept your offering and the fire doesn't come down? It means that you keep waiting and waiting and waiting for the resolution of uh, something. And you feel like the creator of the world is just holding his hand, stop, and, and preventing you from proceeding, right? That you're blocked. And if we view that in those terms, then I think that there are many aspects of, of that in, in the way that this war is felt. There have been tremendous successes, Baruch Hashem, on the battlefield when it comes to the level of the politicians, when it comes to the level of negotiations about the hostages, when it comes to the level of all the different swirling forces around us with you know, the, the endless higher intensity exchanges on the northern border, keeping 100,000 people or more out of their homes. Um, that has not had any resolution yet. Um, the the sense that we haven't actually restored any kind of deterrence with Iran after what they did to us, um, uh, not just with the recent attack, but you know, with going back to the start of the war, um, and, and there's still uh, it, it's incredibly painful to uh, remember. There's still uh, the remaining hostages that are being held in Aza, there's still also uh, a great many armed and trained fighters uh, amongst their enemies in Aza who haven't been destroyed. Um, and, and everything else that is unresolved because of all of the just endless, uh, you know, poschim, right? Jumping back and forth and, and lashing oneself and trying to work the magic according to the standards of the foreign gods, which is, of course, according to the standards of what the U.S. expects and the, Euro and the Europeans expect and all the different uh, forces around in the world whose standards require things of us that tie our hands and say, you can't do this because then you'll be violating international law and you can't do that uh, because uh, these people are innocent even though uh, they actually provided the whole base of operation from which this attack was launched and you, and in many cases participated in all of the worst atrocities, but still, you know, when the UN is counting, they're innocent and you can't touch them, et cetera. All these different ways in which really religions of the rest of the world are being translated into policymaking at the highest levels and the way that this war is being managed uh, by our leaders. And, I think that we are at a point where it must be the case that a whole lot of the nation is fed up, right? And not even fed up in some way where people are, you know, pouring over the text of the Torah and saying, oh, look, when captives were taken in the book of Numbers, Israel swore an oath that they would utterly destroy the enemy. And we have to do the same. We have to utterly destroy the enemy. Some people might be convinced by that. There are plenty of people who will, who will hear that and say, but that's not a basis for making a decision. But one basis for making a decision is seeing that the fire is not taking the offer to Baal, right? That what we've been doing so far hasn't gotten us far enough yet. It's not, hasn't gotten us far enough, far enough with returning hostages. It hasn't gotten us far enough with destroying the enemy and making the whole world look and see that you can't win this way because if it's still the case that part of the Hamas leadership are alive and their army is alive, then they can come out at the end and say that this was worth it to them by their own calculus. If it's the case that, you know, we haven't done anything to assert greater sovereignty on the Temple Mount, perhaps they can say um, that they, you know, succeeded. There's a whole lot of things that haven't happened yet um, since the war started. And perhaps could have happened if we weren't so prostrated before uh, foreign gods that tell us we can't do this and we can't do that. And it may be, with Zerat Hashem soon the case, that there are enough people here, Jews of all stripes, not necessarily who already feel some deep connection to Akados Baruch Hu, but who at least see the folly and the stupidity of the idolatries governing American foreign policy, European foreign policy, whatever else is, you know, creating this labyrinth of 
red lights for us so we can't go this way and we can't go that way, um, people are starting to see that this doesn't work and it doesn't make sense. Uh, and there may be uh, a, an opportunity for much greater national unity just rallying around simple ideas about what does work that has to do with saying we are going to do what will save the lives of our own soldiers, what will save the lives of the captives taken from our people, and we will not worry about the lives of the enemy that attacked us, and we will not worry about uh, the you know, declarations of, uh, or the, the, the cries of, um, uh, the human cry about Israeli criminality on campuses and uh, in uh, parliaments around the world, because we've tried worrying about those things and, it, and it's not getting us where we need to go. And if we would just, enough of us say, look, you know, we disagree about some things, uh, we haven't worked it all out yet. Uh, we're not going to iron out all the fine details of where you can or can't have Hamas on Pesach, et cetera, right now. But what we can do is slaughter the lamb and paint the blood on the door, right? We can all at least agree to defile the gods, uh, the foreign gods, by showing that we are willing to turn away from them and towards each other and our our need for unity around our, our common kinship and purpose. And, and perhaps, you know, ideally with a, a notion that that is also a turn towards Hashem with details to be worked out later of exactly who's right about exactly how much of else of, of the Torah needs to be kept and how. Um, so, Bezrat Hashem, soon we will uh, see Am Yisrael identify a clear opportunity for a strong majority of, of the Jewish people uh, here in the land of Israel and perhaps the world round to say enough is enough. This thing that you say is a constraint for us, like is it an idol that we have to prostrate ourselves before? We're going to kick it over and ignore it because we know better. We know what's right and what's right here uh, is for us to win this war uh, in a way that um, uh, follows standards that come within the tradition of our nation and, and are not being handed to us by imperial overlords. And, and at the time that we do that, I think what we're seeing here is that there will also be a chance for the world uh, and for Am Yisrael to be dazzled by the wonders that Hashem uh, may be willing to do for us in recognition of that sincere, unified national turn away from idolatry and towards him. And we even saw maybe a small example of that in microcosm uh, with what happened with the recent exchange with Iran, right? Because we blew up a building with some very high-ranking Iranian generals in it. Uh, and that was a gutsy move. Um, that is, if you had asked me, do I think that our leadership would be willing to make that play, knowing the circumstances, um, I'm not sure I would have guessed that they would have necessarily been bold enough to do it, right? Because they're very practiced at doing these strikes in Syria and Lebanon. Um, but going for the, the top of the food chain has different political implications. And whenever political implications and things that you know might upset the Americans get involved. These people, you know, Bibi, Gantz, Eisenkot, Ashkenazi, Gallant, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they tread very, very carefully. So I'm not sure I would have necessarily believed that they could, you know, make that play. And they did. And the night that the Iranians sought to respond. Uh, an enormous barrage of deadly weaponry was launched in our direction, and the whole thing fell flat. And this was a tiny, tiny instance of what we're talking about here, because obviously in that situation, it was like one click outside of the comfort zone of what Tzahal does anyway. They're used to blowing up Iranians in Syria who are involved in trying to get weapons moved over there so they can be shot at us. And this was just kind of 
as we said, higher up in the food chain. And it's also just one click out of the, outside of the realm of normal in terms of wonders, because it was so easy after the fact for everyone to say, well, the US and the British and the French helped us and don't we have really great missile defense systems and really that's because we need American money and you know all of this stuff that turns into a justification for actually staying in the same mindset. So I don't think that was enough to, to, to nudge us out. Um, but I think that you see the mechanism there where just doing the right thing and not saying sorry uh, and doing it in a way that defies uh, the the rules set by the you know gods of the imperial overlords. That was enough to earn for us ninety nine point nine percent interception, um, which uh, we have to say was a great wonder that Hashem made for us. Given what else could have happened, uh, it's very easy to forget that uh, we don't always get st stellar performance from our complex high-tech systems. In fact, it was systematic failure of many complex high-tech systems uh, that made slaughter at the beginning of this war possible. And so, yeah, sometimes we invest a lot in complex high-tech systems and they undergo catastrophic failure. Uh, and in, in this instance, the opposite happened. We saw you know, a brilliant clutch performance um, that Akados Baruch Hu choose to grant to us in that moment. And then certainly it was in this chut of a leadership that is almost completely prostrated before um, our foreign uh, fair weather allies and um, uh, that they made a choice uh, that sort of stepped out of the realm of the normal um, and thereby towards Hashem. Uh, like with the painting of the, the blood of the lambs in the door. So may we merit as a nation to find opportunities soon to tell the whole world they don't know right from wrong as well as we do, and that we're going to prosecute this war uh, to completion in the way that is necessary for us uh, to survive and flourish in our land that belongs to our nation since Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov and um, and uh, that if we do that, Bezrat Hashem soon, uh, that will be the moment when the fire comes down and Hashem puts his stamp of approval on everything in a way that no one will be able to miss.